Chapter 5. Savonarola and the Republic, 1492-1534. 1. The Prophet. The advantage of hereditary rule is continuity. Its nemesis is mediocrity. Piero di Lorenzo succeeded without trouble to his father's power, but his character and misjudgments forfeited the popularity upon which the rule of the Medici had been based. He was endowed with a violent temper, a middling mind, a vacillating will, and admirable intentions. He continued Lorenzo's generosity to artists and men of letters, but with less discrimination and tact. He was physically strong, excelled in sports, and took part more frequently and prominently in athletic competitions than Florence thought becoming in the head of an endangered state. It was among his many misfortunes that Lorenzo's enterprises and extravagance had depleted the city's treasury, that the competition of British textiles was causing economic depression in Florence, that Piero's Orsini wife turned up her Roman nose at the Florentines as a nation of shopkeepers, that the collateral branch of the Medici family, derived from Cosimo's brother Lorenzo the Elder, began now to challenge the descendants of Cosimo and led a party of opposition in the name of liberty. It was Piero's crowning misery that he was contemporary with Charles VIII of France, who invaded Italy, and of Savonarola, who proposed to replace the Medici with Christ. Piero had not been built to withstand such strains. The Savonarola family came from Padua to Ferrara about 1440, when Michele Savonarola was invited by Niccolo III d'Este to be his court physician. Michael was a man of piety rare in medicos. He was wont to rebuke the Ferraris for preferring romances to religion. His son Niccolo was a mediocre physician, but Niccolo's wife, Elena Bonacorsi, was a woman of strong character and high ideals. Girolimo was the third of their seven children. They set him in his turn to study medicine, but he thought Thomas Aquinas more absorbing than anatomy, and solitude with his books more pleasant than the sports of youth. At the University of Bologna he was horrified to find no student so poor as to do virtue reverence. To be considered a man here, he wrote, you must defile your mouth with the most filthy, brutal, and tremendous blasphemies. If you study philosophy and the good arts, you are considered a dreamer. If you live chastely and modestly, a fool. If you are pious, a hypocrite. If you believe in God, an imbecile. He left the university and returned to his mother in solitude. He became self-conscious, fretted over the thought of hell and the sinfulness of men. His earliest known composition was a poem denouncing the vices of Italy, including the popes, and pledging himself to reform his country and his church. He passed long hours in prayer, and fasted so earnestly that his parents mourned his emaciation. In 1474 he was stirred to even severer piety by the Lenten sermons of Fra Michele, and he rejoiced to see many Ferraris bringing masks, false hair, playing cards, unseemly pictures, and other worldly apparatus to fling them upon a burning pyre in the marketplace. A year later, aged twenty-three, he fled secretly from home and entered a Dominican monastery in Bologna. He wrote a tender letter to his parents begging their forgiveness for disappointing the expectations they had had of his advancement in the world. When they importuned him to return, he answered angrily, Ye blind! Why do you still weep and lament? You hamper me, though you should rejoice. What can I say if you grieve yet, save that you are my sworn enemies and foes to virtue? If so, then I say to you, Get ye behind me, all ye who work evil. Six years he stayed in the Bologna convent. He proudly asked that the most humble tasks should be given him, but his talent as an orator was discovered, and he was set to preaching. In 1481 he was transferred to San Marco in Florence, and was assigned to preach in the church of San Lorenzo. His sermons there proved unpopular. They were too theological and didactic for a city that knew the eloquence and polish of the humanists. His congregation dwindled week by week. The prior set him to instructing novices. It was probably in the next five years that his final character was formed. As the intensity of his feelings and purposes increased, they wrote themselves upon his features in a furrowed and frowning forehead, the thick lips tight with determination, the immense nose curving out as if to encompass the world, a countenance somber and severe, expressing an infinite capacity for love and hate, a small frame racked and haunted with visions, frustrated aspirations, and introverted storms. I am still flesh like you, he wrote to his parents, 
and the senses are unruly to reason, so that I must struggle cruelly to keep the demon from leaping upon my back. He fasted and flogged himself to tame what seemed to him the inherent corruption of human nature. If he personified the promptings of flesh and pride as satanic voices, he could with equal readiness personify the admonitions of his better self. Alone in his cell, he glorified his solitude by conceiving himself as a battleground of spirits hovering over him for evil or for good. Finally, it seemed to him that angels, archangels, were speaking to him. He accepted their words as divine revelations, and suddenly he spoke to the world as a prophet chosen to be a messenger of God. He avidly absorbed the apocalyptic visions attributed to the apostle John and inherited the eschatology of the mystic Joachim of Flora. Like Joachim, he announced that the reign of Antichrist had come, that Satan had captured the world, that soon Christ would appear to begin his earthly rule, and that divine vengeance would engulf the tyrants, adulterers, and atheists who seemed to dominate Italy. When his prior sent him to preach in Lombardy in 1486, Savonarola abandoned his youthful pedagogic style and cast his sermons into the form of denunciations of immorality, prophecies of doom, and calls to repentance. Thousands of people who could not have followed his earlier arguments listened with awe to the newly impassioned eloquence of a man who seemed to be speaking with authority. Pico della Mirandola heard of the friar's success. He asked Lorenzo to suggest to the prior that Savonarola should be brought back to Florence. Savonarola returned in 1489. Two years later he was chosen prior of San Marco, and Lorenzo found in him an enemy more forthright and powerful than any that had ever crossed his path. Florence was surprised to discover that the swarthy preacher who a decade before had chilled them with argument could now awe them with apocalyptic fantasies, thrill them with vivid descriptions of the paganism, corruption, and immorality of their neighbors, lift up their souls to repentance and hope, and renew in them the full intensity of the faith that had inspired and terrified their youth. Ye women who glory in your ornaments, your hair, your hands, I tell you, you are all ugly. Would you see true beauty? Look at the pious man or woman in whom spirit dominates matter. Watch him when he prays, when a ray of the divine beauty glows upon him when his prayer is ended. You will see the beauty of God shining in his face. You will behold it as if it were the face of an angel. Men marveled at his courage, for he flayed the clergy and the papacy more than the laity, and the princes more than the people, and a note of political radicalism warmed the hearts of the poor. In these days there is no grace, no gift of the Holy Spirit that may not be bought or sold. On the other hand, the poor are oppressed by grievous burdens, and when they are called to pay sums beyond their means, the rich cry unto them, Give me the rest. There be some who, having an income of fifty florins per year, pay a tax on one hundred, while the rich pay little, since the taxes are regulated at their pleasure. Bethink ye well, O rich, for affliction shall smite ye. This city shall no more be called Florence, but a den of thieves, of baseness and bloodshed. Then ye shall all be poverty-stricken, and your name, O priests, shall be changed into a terror. After the priests, the bankers. You have found many ways of making money, and many exchanges which you call lawful, but which are most unjust. And you have corrupted the offices and magistrates of the city. No one can persuade you that usury, interest, is sinful. You defend it at the peril of your souls. No one is ashamed of lending at usury. Nay, those who do otherwise pass for fools. Your brow is that of a whore, and you will not blush. You say, a good and glad life lies in gain. And Christ says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit heaven. And a word for Lorenzo. Tyrants are incorrigible because they are proud, because they love flattery and will not restore ill-gotten gains. They hearken not unto the poor, and neither do they condemn the rich. They corrupt voters and farm out taxes to aggravate the burdens of the people. The tyrant is wont to occupy the people with shows and festivals, in order that they may think of their own pastimes and not of his designs, and, growing unused to the conduct of the commonwealth, may leave the reins of government in his hands. Nor shall that dictatorship be excused on the ground that it finances literature and art. The literature and art, said Savonarola, are pagan. The humanists merely pretend to be Christians. Those ancient authors whom they so sedulously exhume and edit and praise are strangers to Christ and the Christian virtues, and their art is an idolatry of heathen gods or a shameless display of naked women and men. Lorenzo was disturbed. 
His grandfather had founded and enriched the monastery of San Marco. He himself had given to it lavishly. It seemed to him unreasonable that a friar who could know little of the difficulties of government and who idealized a liberty that had been merely the right of the strong to use the weak without hindrance by law should now undermine from a Medici shrine that public support upon which the political power of his family had been built. He tried to appease the friar. He went to Mass in San Marcos and sent the convent rich gifts. Savonarola scorned them and remarked in a subsequent sermon that a faithful dog does not leave off barking in his master's defense because a bone is thrown to him. When he found an unusually large sum in gold in the alms box, he suspected that it came from Lorenzo and gave it to another monastery, saying that silver sufficed the needs of his brethren. Lorenzo sent five leading citizens to argue with him that his inflammatory sermons would lead to useless violence and were unsettling the order and peace of Florence. Savonarola answered by telling them to bid Lorenzo do penance for his sins. A Franciscan friar famous for eloquence was encouraged to preach popular sermons with a view to drawing the Dominican's audience away. The Franciscan failed. Greater throngs than ever before came to San Marco until its church could no longer hold them. For his Lenten sermons of 1491, Savonarola moved his pulpit into the cathedral, and though that edifice had been designed to contain a city, it was crowded whenever the friar was scheduled to speak. The ailing Lorenzo made no further effort to interfere with his preaching. After Lorenzo's death, the weakness of his son Piero made Savonarola the greatest power in Florence. With the reluctant consent of the new pope, Alexander VI, he separated his convent from the Lombard congregation of Dominican monasteries, of which it had been a part, and made himself in practice the independent head of his monastic community. He reformed its regulations and raised the moral and intellectual level of the friars under his rule. New recruits joined his flock, and most of its 250 members developed for him a love and fidelity that upheld him in all but his final ordeal. He became bolder in his criticism of the laic and clerical immorality of the time. Inheriting, however unwittingly, the anti-clerical views of the Waldensian and Paterine heretics who still lurked here and there in northern Italy and central Europe, he condemned the worldly wealth of the clergy, the pomp of ecclesiastical ceremony, the great prelates with splendid mitres of gold and precious stones on their heads, with fine copes and stoles of brocade. He contrasted this affluence with the simplicity of the priests in the early church. These had fewer gold mitres and fewer chalices, for what few they possessed were broken up to relieve the needs of the poor. Whereas our prelates, for the sake of obtaining chalices, will rob the poor of their sole means of support. To these denunciations he added prophecies of doom. He had predicted that Lorenzo and Innocent VIII would die in 1492. They did. Now he predicted that presently the sins of Italy, of her despots and her clergy, would be avenged by a dire disaster that thereafter Christ would lead the nation in a glorious reform, and that he himself, Savonarola, would die a violent death. Early in 1494 he foretold that Charles VIII would invade Italy, and he welcomed the invasion as the chastening hand of God. His sermons at this time, says a contemporary, were so full of terrors and alarms, cries and lamentations, that everyone went about the city bewildered, speechless, and, as it were, half dead. In September 1494, Charles VIII crossed the Apennines into Italy, resolved to add the kingdom of Naples to the French crown. In October, he entered Florentine territory and besieged the fortress of Sarzana. Piero thought he could save Florence from France, as his father had saved it from Naples, by going in person to the enemy. He met Charles at Sarzana and yielded to all demands. Pisa, Leghorn, and every bastion of Florence in the west were surrendered to the French for the duration of the war, and Florence was to advance 200,000 florins, or five million dollars, to help finance Charles's campaign. When the news of these concessions reached Florence, the Signory and the Council were shocked. Contrary to Lorenzo's precedence, they had not been consulted in these negotiations. Led by the Medici opponents of Piero, the Signory decided to depose him and restore the old republic. When Piero returned from Sarzana, he found the gates of the Palazzo Vecchio closed in his face. As he rode to his home, the people jeered him, and urchins pelted him with stones. Fearing for his life, he fled from the city with his family and brothers. The populace sacked the Medici palace and gardens, and the homes of Piero's financial agents. The art collection gathered by four generations of Medici was plundered and scattered, and its remains were sold at auction by the government. 
The Signory offered a reward of 5,000 florins for the delivery of Piero and Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici alive, 2,000 for their delivery dead. It sent five men, including Savonarola, to Charles at Pisa to ask for better terms. Charles met them with noncommittal courtesy. When the delegation had left, the Pisans tore the lion and lilies of Florence from their buildings and declared their independence. Charles entered Florence, consented to some slight modification of his demands, and, eager to get to Naples, led his army to the south. Florence addressed itself now to one of history's most spectacular experiments in democracy. 2. The Statesman On December 2nd, 1494, the citizens were summoned to a parlamento by the great bell in the Palazzo Vecchio Tower. The signory asked and received the power to name twenty men, who would appoint a new signory and new magistrates for a year, after which all offices were to be filled by lot from a register of the approximately three thousand enfranchised males. The twenty dismissed the councils and agencies which under the Medici had considered and administered public affairs, and divided the diverse functions among themselves. They were inadequately experienced for these tasks, and were torn by family factions. The new governmental machinery broke down, and chaos was imminent. Commerce and industry hesitated, men were thrown out of work, and angry crowds gathered in the streets. Piero Capponi persuaded the twenty that order could be saved only by inviting Savonarola into their councils. The friar summoned them to his monastery, and expounded to them an ambitious program of political, economic, and moral legislation. Under his leadership and that of Pietro Soderini, the twenty devised a new constitution, partly modeled on that which was so successfully maintaining stability in Venice. A major concilio, or great council, was to be formed of men who, or their ancestors in the preceding three generations, had held a major office in the state. And these initial members were to choose twenty-eight additional councillors in each year. The executive organs of the government were to remain essentially as under the Medici, a signory of eight friars and a gonfalonier, chosen by the council for a term of two months, and various committees, the twelve, the sixteen, the ten, the eight, to carry on administration, taxation, and war. Complete democracy was postponed as impractical in a society still largely illiterate and subject to waves of passion. But the great council, numbering almost three thousand members, was considered to be a representative body. Since no room in the Palazzo Vecchio could house so large an assemblage, Simone Palaiuolo, Il Cronaca, was engaged to redesign part of the interior into a Sala dei Cinquecento, or Hall of the Five Hundred, where the council could meet in sections. Here, eight years later, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo would be commissioned to paint opposed walls in a famous rivalry. Through Savonarola's influence and eloquence, the proposed constitution received public acclaim, and the new republic came into operation on June 10, 1495. It began amiably by issuing amnesty to all supporters of the deposed Medici regime. With self-respecting generosity, it abolished all taxes except a ten percent levy on income from real property. The merchants who dominated the council thus exempted commerce from taxation and laid the whole burden on the landowning aristocracy and the land-using poor. At Savonarola's urging, the government established a Monte di Pietà, or state loan office, which lent money at five to seven percent and freed the poor from dependence on private money lenders, who had charged up to thirty percent. Again at the friar's prompting, the council attempted to reform morals with laws. It forbade horse races, gross carnival songs, profanity, and gambling. Servants were encouraged to inform against masters who gambled, and convicted offenders were punished with torture. Blasphemers had their tongues pierced, and homosexuals were degraded with merciless penalties. To aid in the enforcement of these reforms, Savonarola organized the boys of his congregation into a moral police. They pledged themselves to attend church regularly, to avoid races, pageants, acrobatic displays, loose company, obscene literature, dancing and music schools, and to wear their hair short. These bands of hope roamed the streets soliciting alms for the church. They dispersed groups that had gathered to gamble, and tore from the bodies of women what they judged to be indecent dress. For a time the city accepted these reforms. Many women gave them enthusiastic support, behaved modestly, dressed plainly, and put aside their jewelry. 
A moral revolution transformed what had been the gay Florence of the Medici. People sang hymns, not Bacchic lyrics, in the streets. Churches were filled, and alms were given in unprecedented quantity. Some bankers and merchants restored illegal gains. Savonarola called upon all the population, rich and poor, to shun idleness and luxury, to work assiduously, and to give a good example with their lives. Your reform, he said, must begin with the things of the Spirit. Your temporal good must serve your moral and religious welfare on which it depends. And if you have heard it said that states are not ruled by paternosters, remember that this is the rule of tyrants, a rule for oppressing, not for liberating a city. If you desire a good government, you must restore it to God. He proposed that Florence should think of its government as having an invisible king, Christ himself, and under this theocracy he predicted utopia. O oh, Florence, then wilt thou be rich with spiritual and temporal wealth. Thou wilt achieve the reformation of Rome, of Italy, of all countries. The wings of thy greatness shall spread over the world. And in truth, Florence had seldom been so happy before. It was a bright moment in the hectic history of virtue. But human nature remained. Men are not naturally virtuous, and social order maintains itself precariously amid the open or secret conflict of egos, families, classes, races, and creeds. A powerful element in the Florentine community itched for taverns, brothels, and gambling halls as outlets for instincts or as sources of gain. The Pazzi, the Denerli, the Caponi, the younger branch of the Medici, and other aristocrats who had affected the expulsion of Piero were furious at seeing the government fall into the hands of a friar. Remnants of Piero's party survived and watched for a chance to restore him and their fortunes. The Franciscan friars worked with religious zeal against the Dominican Savonarola, and a small group of skeptics called for a plague on both their houses. These diverse enemies of the new order agreed in satirizing its supporters as Piagnoni, or weepers, for many wept at Savonarola's sermons, Colitorti, or wry necks, Stropiccioni, or hypocrites, Mastica Paternostri, or prayer munchers, and the recipients of these titles denominated their opponents, from the virulence of their hostility, Arabiati, mad dogs. Early in 1496, the Arabiati succeeded in electing their candidate for Gonfalonier, Filippo Corbizzi. Having assembled in the Palazzo Vecchio a council of ecclesiastics, he summoned Savonarola before it and accused him of political activities improper in a friar. And several churchmen, including one of his own Dominican order, joined in the charge. He replied, Now the words of the Lord are fulfilled. The sons of my mother have fought against me. To be concerned with the affairs of this world is no crime in a monk unless he should mix in them without any higher aim and without seeking to promote the cause of religion. They challenged him to say whether his sermons were inspired by God, but he refused to answer. He returned to his cell a sadder man. He might have overcome his enemies had foreign affairs favored him. The Florentines, who praised liberty, were furious at Pisa for demanding and securing it. Even Savonarola dared not defend the rebellious city, and a cathedral canon who remarked that the Pisans too had a right to be free was severely punished by a Piagnone signory. Savonarola promised to restore Pisa to Florence and rashly claimed that he held Pisa in the hollow of his hands. But he was, as Machiavelli scornfully said, a prophet without arms. When Charles VIII was chased from Italy, Pisa consolidated its independence by an alliance with Milan and Venice and the Florentines mourned that Savonarola had tied them to Charles's falling star, and that they alone had not shared in the glorious expulsion of the French from Italy. Before abandoning the lately Florentine fortresses of Sarzana and Pietra Santa, their French commandants had sold one to Genoa and the other to Lucca. Montepulciano, Arezzo, Volterra, and other Florentine dependencies were agitated by movements for liberation. The once proud and powerful city seemed on the verge of losing nearly all its outlying possessions and all its trade outlets by the Arno, the Adriatic, and the roads to Milan and Rome. Trade suffered, tax revenues fell. The council tried to finance the war against Pisa by forced loans from rich citizens, offering them government bonds in return. But as bankruptcy neared, these bonds declined to 80 to 50 to 10 percent of their face value. 
In 1496, the treasury was exhausted, and the government imitated Lorenzo by borrowing money from a fund confided to the state to provide dowries for poor brides. In the administration of government funds, whether by Arabiati or Piagnoni, corruption and incompetence rose and spread. Francesco Valori, made gonfalonier in January 1497 by a Piagnone majority in the council, maddened the mad dogs by excluding them from all magistracies, denying them membership in the council if they were delinquent in taxes, allowing none but Piagnoni to address the council, and expelling from Florence any Franciscan friar who preached against Savonarola. For eleven months in 1496, rain fell almost daily, ruining the crops of the narrowed hinterland. In 1497, people dropped dead of hunger in the streets. The government opened relief stations to provide grain for the poor. Women were crushed to death in the multitudes that applied. The Medician party plotted to restore Piero. Five leaders were detected and were condemned to death in 1497. Appeal to the council, guaranteed by the Constitution, was refused them. They were executed within a few hours of their condemnation. And many Florentines contrasted the faction violence and severity of the Republic with the order and peace of Lorenzo's time. Hostile crowds repeatedly demonstrated before Savonarola's monastery. Piagnoni and Arabiati stoned each other in the streets. When the friar preached on Ascension Day of 1497, his sermon was interrupted by a riot in which his enemies tried to seize him and were repulsed by his friends. A gonfalonier proposed to the seigniory that he should be banished as a means of quieting the city, and the proposal was lost by a single vote. Amid this bitter collapse of his dream, Savonarola faced and defied the strongest power in Italy. 3. The Martyr Pope Alexander VI was not deeply disturbed by Savonarola's criticism of the clergy or of the morals of Rome. He had heard the like before. Hundreds of ecclesiastics for centuries past had complained that many priests lived immoral lives and that the popes loved wealth and power more than became the vicars of Christ. Alexander was of a genial temperament. He did not mind a little criticism so long as he felt secure in the apostolic chair. What disturbed him in Savonarola was the friar's politics, not the semi-democratic nature of the new constitution. Alexander had no special interest in the Medici, and perhaps preferred in Florence a weak republic to a strong dictatorship. Alexander feared another French invasion. He had joined in forming a League of Italian States to expel Charles VIII and to discourage a second French attack. He resented the adherence of Florence to its alliance with France, considered Savonarola the power behind this policy, and suspected him of secret correspondence with the French government. Savonarola wrote to Charles VIII about this time three letters, seconding the proposal of Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere, that the king should call a general council of ecclesiastics and statesmen to reform the church and depose Alexander as an infidel and a heretic. Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, representing Milan at the papal court, urged the pope to end the friar's preaching and influence. On July 21, 1495, Alexander wrote a brief note to Savonarola. To our well-beloved son, greeting and the apostolic benediction. We have heard that of all the workers in the Lord's vineyard, thou art the most zealous, at which we deeply rejoice, and give thanks to Almighty God. We have likewise heard that thou dost assert thy predictions proceed not from thee, but from God. The church, to check false prophets, had pronounced such claims to be heretical. Therefore we desire, as behooves our pastoral office, to have speech with thee, considering these things, so that, being by these means better informed of God's will, we may be better able to fulfill it. Wheretofore, by thy vow of holy obedience, we enjoin thee to wait on us without delay, and shall welcome thee with loving kindness. This letter was a triumph for Savonarola's enemies, for it placed him in a situation where he must either end his career as a reformer or flagrantly disobey the Pope. He feared that once in the papal power he would never be allowed to return to Florence. He might end his days in a Sant'Angelo dungeon and if he did not come back, his supporters would be ruined. On their advice, he replied to Alexander that he was too ill to travel to Rome. That the Pope's motives were political appeared when he wrote to the Signory on September 8th, protesting against the continued alliance of Florence with France, and exhorting the Florentines not to endure the reproach of being the only Italians allied with the enemies of Italy. At the same time, he ordered Savonarola to desist from preaching, 
to submit to the authority of the Dominican Vicar General in Lombardy, and to go wherever the Vicar General should bid him. Savonarola replied on September 29th that his congregation was unwilling to subordinate itself to the Vicar General, but that meanwhile he would refrain from preaching. Alexander, in a conciliatory response on October 16th, repeated his prohibition of preaching and expressed the hope that when Savonarola's health should permit, he would come to Rome to be received in a joyful and fatherly spirit. There, for a year, Alexander let the problem rest. Meanwhile, the prior's party had recaptured control of the council and the seigniory. The emissaries of the Florentine government in Rome besought the Pope to withdraw his interdict on the friar's preaching, urging that Florence needed his moral stimulus in Lent. Alexander seems to have given a verbal consent, and on February 17, 1496, Savonarola resumed his preaching in the cathedral. About this time, Alexander commissioned a learned Dominican bishop to examine Savonarola's published sermons for heresy. The bishop reported, Most Holy Father, this friar says nothing that is not wise and honest. He speaks against simony and the corruption of the priesthood, which in truth is very great. He respects the dogmas and authority of the church, wherefore I would rather seek to make him my friend, if need be by offering him the cardinal's purple. Alexander complacently sent a Dominican to Florence to offer Savonarola the red hat. The friar felt not complimented, but shocked. This to him was but another instance of simony. His answer to Alexander's emissary was, Come to my next sermon, and you will have my reply to Rome. His first sermon of the year reopened his conflict with the Pope. It was an event in the history of Florence. Half the excited city wished to hear him, and even the vast Duomo could not contain all who sought entry, though within they were crowded so tightly that no one could move. A group of armed friends escorted the prior to the cathedral. He began by explaining his long absence from the pulpit and affirming his full loyalty to the teachings of the church, but then he issued an audacious challenge to the Pope. The superior may not give me any command contrary to the rules of my order. The Pope may not give any command opposed to charity or the gospel. I do not believe that the Pope would ever seek to do so. But were he so to do, I should say to him, Now thou art no pastor, thou art not the Church of Rome, thou art in error. Whenever it be clearly seen that the commands of superiors are contrary to God's commandments, and especially when contrary to the precepts of charity, no one is in such case bound to obedience. Were I to clearly see that my departure from a city would be the spiritual and temporal ruin of the people, I would obey no living man that commanded me to depart, for as much as in obeying him I should disobey the commands of the Lord. In a sermon for the second Sunday in Lent, he denounced the morals of Christendom's capital in harsh terms. One thousand, ten thousand, fourteen thousand harlots are few for Rome, for there both men and women are made harlots. These sermons were spread throughout Europe by the new marvel, the printing press, and were read everywhere, even by the Sultan of Turkey. They aroused a war of pamphlets in and out of Florence, some of them accusing the friar of heresy and indiscipline, others defending him as a prophet and a saint. Alexander sought an indirect escape from open war. In November 1496, he ordered the union of all Tuscan Dominican monasteries in a new Tuscan Roman congregation to be directly under the authority of Padre Giacomo da Sicilia. Padre Giacomo was favorably disposed toward Savonarola but would presumably accept a papal suggestion to transfer the friar to another environment. Savonarola refused to obey the order of union and took his case over the head of the Pope to the public at large in a pamphlet called An Apology of the Brethren of San Marco. This union, he argued, is impossible, unreasonable, and hurtful, nor can the Brethren of San Marco be bound to agree to it, inasmuch as superiors may not issue commands contrary to the rules of the order nor contrary to the law of charity or the welfare of our souls. Technically, all monastic congregations were directly subject to the popes. A pope might compel the merger of congregations against their will. Savonarola himself, in 1493, had approved Alexander's order uniting the Dominican congregation of St. Catherine's at Pisa against its will with Savonarola's congregation of St. Mark. Alexander, however, took no immediate action. Savonarola continued to preach and issued to the public a series of letters defending his defiance of the Pope. As the Lenten season of 1497 approached, 
the Arabiati prepared to celebrate carnival by such festivities, processions, and songs as had been sanctioned under the Medici. To counter these plans, Savonarola's loyal aide, Fra Domenico, instructed the children of the congregation to organize a quite different celebration. During the week of carnival, preceding Lent, these boys and girls went about the city in bands, knocked at doors, and asked for, sometimes demanded, the surrender of what they called vanities or cursed objects, anatomase, pictures considered immoral, love songs, carnival masks and costumes, false hair, fancy dresses, playing cards, dice, musical instruments, cosmetics, wicked books like the Decameron or the Morgante Maggiore. On the final day of carnival, February 7th, the more ardent supporters of Savonarola, singing hymns, marched in solemn procession behind a figure of the infant Jesus carved by Donatello and borne by four children in the guise of angels to the Piazza della Signoria. There a great pyramid of combustible material had been raised, sixty feet high and two hundred forty feet in circumference at the base. Upon the seven stages of the pyramid, the vanities, collected during the week, or now brought to the sacrifice, were arranged or thrown, including precious manuscripts and works of art. Fire was set to the pyre at four points, and the bells of the Palazzo Vecchio were rung to acclaim this first Savonarolan burning of the vanities. The Lenten sermons of the friar carried the war to Rome. While accepting the principle that the church should have some terra firma of temporal power, he argued that the wealth of the church was the source of her deterioration. His invective knew no bounds. The earth teems with bloodshed, yet the priests take no heed. Rather, by their evil example, they bring spiritual death upon all. They have withdrawn from God, and their piety consists in spending their nights with harlots. They say that God hath no care of the world, that all cometh by chance. Neither believe they that Christ is present in the sacrament. Come hither, thou ribald church. The Lord saith, I gave thee beautiful vestments, but thou hast made idols of them. Thou hast dedicated the sacred vessels to vainglory, the sacraments to simony. Thou hast become a shameless harlot in thy lusts. Thou art lower than a beast. Thou art a monster of abomination. Once thou felt shame for thy sins, but now thou art shameless. Once anointed priests called their sons nephews, but now they speak of their sons. A reference to Alexander the Sixth, the candor about his children. And thus, O prostitute church, thou hast displayed thy foulness to the whole world, and stinkest unto heaven. Savonarola suspected that such tirades would earn him excommunication. He welcomed it. Many of ye say that excommunication will be decreed. For my part I beseech thee, O Lord, that it may come quickly. Bear this excommunication aloft on a lance. Open the gates to it. I will reply to it. And if I do not amaze thee, then thou mayest say what thou wilt. O Lord, I seek only thy cross. Let me be persecuted. I ask this grace of thee. Let me not die in my bed, but let me give my blood for thee, even as thou gavest thine for me. These passionate sermons created a furor throughout Italy. Men came from distant cities to hear them. The Duke of Ferrara came in disguise. The crowd overflowed from the cathedral into the square, and each striking sentence was relayed from those within to those without. In Rome the people turned almost unanimously against the friar and called for his punishment. In April 1497 the Arabiati secured control of the council, and, on pretext of danger from the plague, forbade all preaching in the churches after May 5th. Urged on by Roman agents of the Arabiati, Alexander signed a decree excommunicating the friar on May 13th. But he let it be known that he would rescind the excommunication if Savonarola would obey the summons to Rome. The prior, fearing imprisonment, still refused, but for six months he held his peace. Then on Christmas Day he sang High Mass at San Marco, gave the Eucharist to his friars, and led them in a solemn procession around the square. Many were scandalized at an excommunicate celebrating Mass, but Alexander made no protest. On the contrary, he intimated that he would withdraw the excommunication if Florence would join the League to resist a second invasion from France. The Signory, gambling on the success of the French, rejected the proposal. On February 11, 1498, Savonarola completed his rebellion by preaching in San Marco. He denounced the excommunication as unjust and invalid, and charged with heresy any man who should uphold its validity. Finally, he issued an excommunication himself. 
Therefore, on him that giveth commands opposed to charity, anathema sit, let there be a curse. Were such a command pronounced by an angel, even by the Virgin Mary herself and all the saints, which is certainly impossible, anathema sit. And if any pope hath ever spoken to the contrary, let him be declared excommunicate. On the last day before Lent, Savonarola read Mass in the open square before San Marcos, administered the sacrament to a great multitude, and publicly prayed. O Lord, if my deeds be not sincere, if my words be not inspired by Thee, strike me dead on this instant. That afternoon his followers staged a second burning of the vanities. Alexander informed the Signory that unless it could dissuade Savonarola from further preaching, he would lay an interdict upon the city. Though now thoroughly hostile to the prior, the Signory refused to silence him, preferring to let the onus of such a prohibition remain with the Pope. Besides, the eloquent friar might be useful in combating a Pope who was organizing the Papal States into a power too strong for the comfort of its neighbors. Savonarola continued to preach, but only in the church of his monastery. The Florentine ambassador reported that feeling against the friar was so intense in Rome that no Florentine was safe there, and he feared that if the Pope issued the threatened interdict, all Florentine merchants in Rome would be thrown into jail. The Signory yielded and ordered Savonarola to quit preaching, this on March 17th. He obeyed but predicted great calamities for Florence. Fra Domenico filled the convent pulpit in his stead and served as the voice of his prior. Meanwhile, Savonarola wrote to the sovereigns of France, Spain, Germany, and Hungary, begging them to call a general council for the reform of the Church. The moment of vengeance has arrived. The Lord commands me to reveal new secrets and make manifest to the world the peril by which the bark of St. Peter is threatened, owing to your long neglect. The church is all teeming with abomination, from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Yet not only do ye apply no remedy, but ye do homage to the cause of the woes by which she is polluted. Wherefore the Lord is greatly angered, and hath long left the church without a shepherd. For I hereby testify that this Alexander is no pope, nor can be held as one, inasmuch as, leaving aside the mortal sin of simony, by which he hath purchased the papal chair, and daily selleth the benefices of the church to the highest bidder, and likewise putting aside his other manifest vices, I declare that he is no Christian, and believes in no God. If, he added, the kings will call a council, he will appear before it and give proof of all these charges. One of these letters was intercepted by a Milanese agent, and was sent to Alexander. On March 25, 1498, a Franciscan friar, preaching in the church of Santa Croce, turned the drama of the case upon himself by challenging Savonarola to an ordeal of fire. He stigmatized the Dominican as a heretic and false prophet, and offered to walk through fire if Savonarola would do the same. He expected, he said, that both of them would be burned, but hoped by his sacrifice to free Florence from the disorders that had been caused by a proud Dominican's disobedience of the Pope. Savonarola rejected the challenge. Domenico accepted it. The hostile signory seized the chance to discredit a prior who in its view had become a troublesome demagogue. It approved of the resort to medieval methods and arranged that on April 7th, Fra Giuliano Rondinelli of the Franciscans and Fra Domenico da Pescia should enter a fire in the Piazza della Signoria. On the appointed day, the great square was filled with a crowd eager to enjoy a miracle or the sight of human suffering. Every window and roof overlooking the scene was occupied with spectators. In the center of the square, Athwart a passage two feet wide, twin pyres had been erected of wood mixed with pitch, oil, resin, and gunpowder, guaranteed to make a searing flame. The Franciscan friars took their stand in the Loggia dei Lanzi. The Dominicans marched in from the opposite direction. Fra Domenico carried a consecrated host, Savonarola a crucifix. The Franciscans complained that Fra Domenico's red cape might have been charmed into incombustibility by the prior. They insisted on his discarding it. He protested. The crowd urged him to yield. He did. The Franciscans asked him to remove other garments, which they thought might have been charmed. Domenico consented, went into the palace of the Signory, and changed clothes with another friar. The Franciscans urged that he should be forbidden to approach Savonarola, lest he be re-enchanted. Domenico submitted to being surrounded by Franciscans. They objected to his carrying either a crucifix or a consecrated host into the fire. He surrendered the crucifix but kept the host, and a long theological discussion ensued between Savonarola and the Franciscans, 
as to whether Christ would be burned along with the appearances of bread. Meanwhile, the Franciscan champion remained in the palace, begging the seigneury to save him by any ruse. The priors allowed the discussions to go on till darkness fell, and then announced that the ordeal could no longer take place. The crowd, cheated of blood, attacked the palace but was repulsed. Some Arabiati tried to seize Savonarola, but his guard protected him. The Dominicans returned to San Marco, jeered by the populace, though apparently the Franciscans had been the chief cause of delay. Many complained that Savonarola, after claiming that he was inspired by God and that God would protect him, had allowed Domenico to represent him in the ordeal instead of facing it himself. These thoughts spread through the city, and almost overnight the prior's following faded away. On the morrow, Palm Sunday, a mob of Arabiati and others marched to attack the monastery of San Marco. On the way they killed some Piagnoni, including Francesco Valori. His wife, drawn to a window by his cries, was shot through with an arrow. His house was pillaged and burned. One of his grandchildren was smothered to death. The bell of San Marco told to call the Piagnoni to the rescue, but they did not come. The friars prepared to defend themselves with swords and clubs. Savonarola in vain bade them lay down their arms, and himself stood unarmed at the altar, awaiting death. The friars fought valiantly. Fray Enrico wielded his sword with secular delight, accompanying each blow with a lusty cry, Salvum fac populum tuum domine, save thy people, Lord. But the hostile crowd was too numerous for the friars. Savonarola finally prevailed upon them to lay down their arms, and when an order came from the signory for his arrest and that of Domenico, the two surrendered and were led through a mob that jeered, struck, kicked, and spat upon them to cells in the Palazzo Vecchio. On the following day, Fra Silvestro was added to the prisoners. The signory sent to Pope Alexander an account of the ordeal and arrest, begged his absolution for the violence committed on an ecclesiastic, and asked his authorization to subject the prisoners to trial and, if necessary, to torture. The Pope urged that the three friars should be sent to Rome to be tried before an ecclesiastical court. The signory refused, and the Pope had to be content with having two papal delegates share in examining the accused. The signory was resolved that Savonarola should die. As long as he lived, his party would live. Only his death, they thought, could heal the strife of factions that had so divided the city and its government that alliance with Florence had become worthless to any foreign power, and Florence lay open to internal conspiracy or external attack. Following the custom established by the Inquisition, the examiners put the three friars to torture on various occasions between April 9th and May 22nd. Silvestro succumbed at once, and answered so readily as the examiners wished that his confession was too facile to be useful. Domenico resisted to the last. Tortured to the verge of death, he continued to avow that Savonarola was a saint without guile or sin. Savonarola, high-strung and exhausted, soon collapsed under torture and gave whatever replies were suggested to him. Recovering, he retracted the confession. Tortured again, he yielded again. After three ordeals, his spirit broke, and he signed a confused confession that he had no divine inspiration, that he had been guilty of pride and ambition, that he had urged foreign and secular powers to call a general council of the Church, and that he had plotted for the deposition of the Pope. On charges of schism and heresy, of revealing confessional secrets as pretended visions and prophecies, of causing faction and disorder in the state, the three friars were condemned to death by the united sentence of state and church. Alexander graciously sent them absolution. On May 23, 1498, the Parricide Republic executed its founder and his comrades. Unfrocked and barefoot, they were led to the same Piazza della Signoria, where twice they had burned the vanities. As then, and as for the trial by ordeal, a great crowd gathered for the site, but now the government supplied it with food and drink. A priest asked Savonarola, In what spirit do you bear this martyrdom? He answered, The Lord has suffered much for me. He kissed the crucifix that he carried, and did not speak again. The friars walked bravely to their doom, Domenico almost joyfully, singing a Te Deum in gratitude for a martyr's death. The three men were hanged from a gibbet, and boys were allowed to stone them as they choked. A great fire was lighted under them and burned them to ashes. The ashes were thrown into the Arno, lest they be worshipped as the relics of saints. Some Piagnoni, braving incrimination, knelt in the square and wept and prayed. Every year until 1703, on the morning after the 23rd of May, flowers were strewn on the spot where the hot blood of the friars fell. 
Today, a plaque in the pavement marks the site of the most famous crime in Florentine history. Savonarola was the Middle Ages, surviving into the Renaissance, and the Renaissance destroyed him. He saw the moral decay of Italy under the influence of wealth and a declining religious belief, and he stood bravely, fanatically, vainly against the sensual and skeptical spirit of the times. He inherited the moral fervor and mental simplicity of medieval saints and seemed out of place and key in a world that was singing the praises of rediscovered pagan Greece. He failed through his intellectual limitations and a forgivable but irritating egotism. He exaggerated his illumination and his capacity and naively underestimated the task of opposing at once the power of the papacy and the instincts of men. He was understandably shocked by Alexander's morals, but intemperate in his denunciations and intransigent in his policy. He was a Protestant before Luther, only in the sense of calling for a reform of the church. He shared none of Luther's theological dissents. But his memory became a force in the Protestant mind. Luther called him a saint. His influence on literature was slight, for literature was in the hands of skeptics and realists like Machiavelli and Guicciardini. But his influence on art was immense. Fra Bartolomeo signed his portrait of the friar, Portrait of Girolamo of Ferrara, Prophet Sent by God. Botticelli turned from paganism to piety under Savonarola's preaching. Michelangelo heard the friar frequently and read his sermons devotedly. It was the spirit of Savonarola that moved the brush over the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and traced behind the altar the terrible last judgment. The grandeur of Savonarola lay in his effort to achieve a moral revolution, to make men honest, good, and just. We know that this is the most difficult of all revolutions, and we cannot wonder that Savonarola failed where Christ succeeded with so pitiful a minority of men. But we know, too, that such a revolution is the only one that would mark a real advance in human affairs, and that beside it the bloody overturns of history are transient and ineffectual spectacles, changing anything but man. 4. The Republic and the Medici, 1498-1534 the chaos that had almost nullified government in the later years of Savonarola's ascendancy was not mitigated by his death. The brief term of two months allowed to each seigneury and gonfalonier made for a hectic discontinuity in the executive branch and inclined the priors to irresponsibility and corruption. In 1502 the council, dominated by a triumphant oligarchy of rich men, sought to overcome part of this difficulty by electing the gonfalonier for life, so that while still subject to seigneury and council, he might face the popes and the secular rulers of Italy on terms of equal tenure. The first man to receive this honor was Pietro Soderini, a millionaire friendly to the people, an honest patriot, whose powers of mind and will were not so eminent as to threaten Florence with dictatorship. He enlisted Machiavelli among his advisers, governed prudently and economically, and used his private fortune to resume that patronage of art which had been interrupted under Savonarola. With his support, Machiavelli replaced the mercenary troops of Florence with a citizen militia, which finally, in 1508, forced Pisa to yield again to a Florentine protectorate. But in 1512, the foreign policy of the Republic brought on the disaster that Alexander VI had foretold. Through all the efforts of the Holy League of Venice, Milan, Naples, and Rome to rid Italy of its French invaders, Florence had persisted in its alliance with France. When victory crowned the League, it turned in revenge upon Florence and sent its troops to replace the Republican oligarchy with a Medician dictatorship. Florence resisted, and Machiavelli labored strenuously to organize its defense. Its outpost, Prato, was taken and sacked, and Machiavelli's militia turned and fled from the trained mercenaries of the League. Soderini resigned to avoid further bloodshed. Giuliano de' Medici, son of Lorenzo, having contributed 10,000 ducats, or a quarter of a million dollars, to the League treasury, entered Florence under the protection of Spanish, German, and Italian arms. His brother, Cardinal Giovanni, soon joined him. The Savonarolan constitution was abolished, and the Medician ascendancy was restored. This in 1512. Giuliano and Giovanni behaved with moderation, and the public, surfeited with excitement, readily accepted the change. When Giovanni became Leo X in 1513, Giuliano, having proved too gentle to be a successful ruler, yielded the government of Florence to his nephew Lorenzo. This ambitious youth died after six years of reckless rule. Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, son of the Giuliano who had been slain in the Pazzi conspiracy, now gave Florence an excellent administration. 
and after he became Clement VII in 1521, he ruled the city from the papal chair. Florence took advantage of his misfortunes to expel his representatives in 1527, and for four years it again enjoyed the trials of liberty. But Clement tempered defeat with diplomacy, and used the troops of Charles V to avenge his ousted relatives. An army of Spanish and German troops marched upon Florence in 1529 and repeated the story of 1512. Resistance was heroic but vain, and Alessandro de' Medici began in 1531 a regime of oppression, brutality, and lechery unprecedented in the annals of the family. Three centuries would pass before Florence would know freedom again. 5. Art Under the Revolution An age of political excitement is usually a stimulant to literature, and we shall study later two writers of the first rank, Machiavelli and Guicciardini, who belonged to this period. But a state always verging on bankruptcy and engaged in almost permanent revolution does not favor art, and least of all architecture. Some rich men, skilled in floating on a flood, still gave hostages to fortune by building palaces. So Giovanni Francesco and Aristotele da Sangallo, working on plans by Raphael, raised a palatial mansion for the Pandolfini family. In 1520-24, Michelangelo designed for Cardinal Giulio de' Medici a Nuova Sagrestia, or New Sacristy, for the Church of San Lorenzo, a simple quadrangle and modest dome known to all the world as the home of Michelangelo's finest sculptures, the tombs of the Medici. Among the Titan's rivals was the sculptor Pietro Torrigiano, who worked with him in Lorenzo's garden of statuary and broke his nose to win an argument. Lorenzo was so incensed by this violence that Torrigiano took refuge in Rome. He became a soldier in Caesar Borgia's service, fought bravely in several battles, found his way to England, and designed there one of the masterpieces of English art, the tomb of Henry VII in Westminster Abbey, this in 1519. Wandering restlessly to Spain, he carved a handsome Madonna and child for the Duke of Arcos. But the Duke underpaid him. The sculptor smashed the statue to bits, the vengeful aristocrat denounced him to the Inquisition as a heretic. Torrigiano was sentenced to severe punishment, but cheated his foes by starving himself to death. Florence had never had so many great artists at one time as in 1492, but many of them fled from her turbulence and lent their renown to other scenes. Leonardo went to Milan, Michelangelo to Bologna, Andrea Sansovino to Lisbon. Sansovino took his cognomen from Monte San Savino, and made it so famous that the world forgot his real name, Andrea di Domenico Contucci. Born the son of a poor laborer, he developed a passion for drawing and for modeling in clay. A kindly Florentine sent him to the studio of Antonio del Paliuoli. Maturing rapidly, he built for the church of Santo Spirito a chapel of the sacrament, with statues and reliefs so vigorous and excellent, said Vasari, that they are without a flaw and before it he placed a bronze grill that halts the breath with its beauty. King John II of Portugal begged Lorenzo to send the young artist to him. Andrea went and labored nine years there in sculpture and architecture. Lonesome for Italy, he returned to Florence in 1500, but soon passed to Genoa and finally to Rome. In Santa Maria del Popolo, he built two marble tombs for Cardinals Sforza and Bassa della Rovere, which won him high acclaim in a city then, in 1505 to 1507, buzzing with geniuses. Leo X sent him to Loreto, and there, from 1523 to 1528, Andrea adorned the Church of Santa Maria with a series of reliefs from the life of the Virgin, so beautiful that the angel in the Annunciation seemed to Vasari not marble but celestial. Soon afterward, Andrea retired to a farm near his native Monte San Savino, lived energetically as a peasant, and died in 1529, aged 68. Meanwhile, the Della Robbia family had faithfully and skillfully carried on the work of Luca in glazed clay. Andrea Della Robbia exceeded in longevity even the eighty-five years of his uncle, and had time to train three sons in the art, Giovanni, Luca, and Girolamo. Andrea's terracottas have a brilliance of tone and a tenderness of sentiment that snare the eye and still the feet of the museum traveler. A room in the Bargello is rich with him, and the Hospital of the Innocents is distinguished by his decorative lunette of the Annunciation. Giovanni della Robbia rivaled his father Andrea's excellence, as one may see in the Bargello and the Louvre. The della Robbias almost confined themselves to religious subjects through three generations. They were among the most fervent supporters of Savonarola. 
and two of Andrea's sons joined the Brethren of San Marco to seek salvation with the friar. The painters felt Savonarola's influence most deeply. Lorenzo di Credi learned his art from Verrocchio, imitated the style of his fellow student Leonardo, and took the tenderness of his religious pictures from the piety nurtured in him by Savonarola's eloquence and fate. He spent half his life painting Madonnas. We find them almost everywhere, in Rome, Florence, Turin, Avignon, Cleveland. The face is poor, the robes magnificent. Perhaps the best is the Annunciation in the Uffizi. At the age of seventy-two, feeling a time to take on the savor of sanctity, Lorenzo went to live with the monks of Santa Maria Nuova, and there, six years later, he died. Piero di Cosimo took his cognomen from his teacher Cosimo Rosselli, for he who instructs ability and promotes well-being is as truly a father as the one who begets. Cosimo came to the conclusion that his pupil surpassed him. Summoned by Sixtus IV to decorate the Sistine Chapel, he took Piero with him, and Piero painted there the destruction of Pharaoh's troops in the Red Sea, with a gloomy landscape of water, rocks, and cloudy sky. He has left us two magnificent portraits, both in The Hague, of Giuliano da Sangallo and Francesco da Sangallo. Piero was all artist, caring little for society or friendship, loving nature and solitude, absorbed in the pictures and scenes that he painted. He died unconfessed and alone, having transmitted his art to two pupils who followed his example by surpassing their master, Fra Bartolomeo and Andrea del Sarto. Baccio della Porta took his last name from the gate of San Piero, where he lived. When he became a friar, he received the name Fra Bartolomeo, Brother Bartholomew. Having studied with Cosimo Rosselli and Piero di Cosimo, he opened a studio with Mariotto Albertinelli, painted many pictures in collaboration with him, and remained bound to him in a fine friendship till parted by death. He was a modest youth, eager for instruction and receptive to every influence. For a time he sought to catch the subtle shading of Leonardo. When Raphael came to Florence, Baccio studied perspective with him and better blending of colors. Later he visited Raphael in Rome and painted with him a noble head of St. Peter. Finally he fell in love with the majestic style of Michelangelo, but he lacked the terrible intensity of that angry giant, and when Bartolomeo attempted the monumental, he lost in the enlargement of his simple ideas the charm of his qualities, the rich depth and soft shading of his colors, the stately symmetry of his composition, the piety and sentiment of his themes. He was deeply stirred by the sermons of Savonarola, he brought to the burning of the vanities all his paintings of the nude. When the enemies of the friar attacked the convent of San Marco in 1498, he joined in its defense. In the course of the melee he vowed to become a monk if he survived. He kept his pledge, and in 1500 he entered the Dominican monastery at Prato. For five years he refused to paint, giving himself up to religious exercises. Transferred to San Marco, he consented to add his masterpieces in blue, red, and black to the rosy frescoes of Fra Angelico. There, in the refectory, he painted a Madonna and Child and a Last Judgment. In the cloisters, a St. Sebastian, and in Savonarola's cell, a powerful portrait of the friar in the guise of St. Peter a Martyr. The St. Sebastian was the only nude that he painted after becoming a monk. Originally, it was placed in the church of San Marco, but it was so handsome that some women confessed to having been stirred to wicked thoughts by it, and the friar sold it to a Florentine who sent it to the King of France. Fra Bartolomeo continued to paint until 1517, when disease so paralyzed his hands that he could no longer hold the brush. He died in that year at the age of 45. His only rival for supremacy among the Italian painters of this period was another disciple of Piero di Cosimo. Andrea Domenico Daniolo di Francesco Vanucci is known to us as Andrea del Sarto because his father was a tailor. Like most Renaissance artists, he developed quickly, beginning his apprenticeship at seven. Piero marveled at the lad's skill and design, and noted with warm approval how Andrea, when a holy day closed the studio, spent his time drawing the figures in the famous cartoons made by Leonardo and Michelangelo for the Hall of the Five Hundred in the Palazzo Vecchio. When Piero became in old age too eccentric a master, Andrea and his fellow student, Francia Biggio, set up their own bottega and for some time worked together. Andrea seems to have begun his independent career by painting, in the court of the Annunziata Church in 1509, five scenes from the life of San Filippo Benizzi, a Florentine noble who had founded the Order of the Servites for the special worship of Mary. These frescoes, though sorely injured by time and exposure, 
are so remarkable for draftsmanship, composition, vividness of narrative, and the soft merging of warm and harmonious colors, that this atrium is now one of the goals of art pilgrims in Florence. For one of the female figures, Andrea used as model the woman who in the course of these paintings became his wife, Lucrezia del Fede, a sensuously beautiful shrew whose dark face and raven hair haunted the artist to all but his dying days. In 1515, Andrea and Franciabigio undertook a series of frescoes in the cloisters of the Scalzo Fraternity. They chose as subject the life of St. John the Baptist. But it was surely Andrea's hand that in several figures displayed one of his specialties, picturing the female breast in all the perfection of its texture and form. In 1518, he accepted the invitation of Francis I to come to France. There he painted the figure of charity that hangs in the Louvre. But his wife, left behind in Florence, begged him to come back. The king granted permission on Andrea's pledge to return and entrusted him with a considerable sum to buy works of art for him in Italy. Andrea, in Florence, spent the royal funds in building himself a house and never went back to France. Facing bankruptcy, nevertheless, he resumed his painting and produced for the cloisters of the Annunziata a masterpiece which, said Vasari, in design, grace, excellence of coloring, vivacity and relief, proved him far superior to all his predecessors, who included Leonardo and Raphael. This Madonna del Sacco, absurdly so called because Mary and Joseph are shown leaning against a sack, is now damaged and faded, and no longer conveys the full splendor of its color, but its perfect composition, soft tones, and quiet presentation of a family, with Joseph suddenly literate reading a book, make it one of the great pictures of the Renaissance. In the refectory of the Salvi Monastery, Andrea challenged Leonardo with the Last Supper of 1526, choosing the same moment and theme, One of you shall betray me. Bolder than Leonardo, Andrea finished the face of his Christ. Even he, however, fell far short of the spiritual depth and understanding gentleness that we associate with Jesus. But the apostles are strikingly individualized, the action is vivid, the colors are rich and soft and full, and the picture as seen from the entrance of the refectory conveys almost irresistibly the illusion of a living scene. The Virgin Mother remained the favorite subject of Andrea, as of most artists of Renaissance Italy. He painted her again and again in studies of the Holy Family, as in the Borghese Gallery in Rome or the Metropolitan Museum in New York. He pictured her in one of the treasures of the Uffizi Gallery as Madonna delle Arpie, Madonna of the Harpies, so named from the avenging fates presented on the pedestal. This is the fairest of the Lucrezia virgins, and the child is the finest in Italian art. Across the Arno in the Pitti Gallery, the assumption of the virgin shows apostles and holy women looking up in amazement and adoration as cherubim raise the praying Madonna, again Lucrezia, to heaven. So in Andrea's colorful illumination, the moving epos of the virgin is complete. There is seldom any sublimity in Andrea del Sarto, no majesty of Michelangelo, nor the unfathomable nuances of Leonardo, nor the finished perfection of Raphael, nor yet the range or power of the great Venetians. Yet he alone of the Florentines rivals the Venetians in color and Correggio in grace. His mastery of tones, in their depth and modulation and transparency, might well be preferred to the lavishment of color in Titian, Tintoretto, and Veronese. We miss variety in Andrea. His paintings move within too small a circle of subject and sentiment. His hundred Madonnas are always the same young Italian mother, modest and lovely, and at last cloyingly sweet. But no one has surpassed him in composition, few in anatomy, modeling, and design. There is a little fellow in Florence, said Michelangelo to Raphael, who will bring sweat to your brow if ever he is engaged in great works. Andrea himself never lived to reach full maturity. The victorious Germans, capturing Florence in 1530, infected it with plague, and Andrea was one of its victims. His wife, who had aroused in him all the heartaches of jealousy that beauty brings to marriage, shunned his room in those last fevered days, and the artist who had given her an almost deathless life died with no one by his side at the age of forty-four. About 1570, Jacopo d'Aimpoli went to the court of the Annunziata to copy del Sarto's nativity. An old lady who had come to Mass stopped beside him and pointed to a figure in the foreground of the painting. It is I, she said. Lucrezia had outlived herself by forty years. The few artists whom we have here commemorated must be viewed not as a record, 
but as representatives of the plastic and graphic genius of this period. There were other sculptors and painters of the time who still lead a ghostly existence in the museums, Benedetto de Rovezzano, Francia Biggio, Rodolfo Ghirlandaio, and hundreds more. There were half-secluded artists, monastic and secular, who still practiced the intimate art of illuminating manuscripts, like Fra Eustachio and Antonio di Girolamo. There were calligraphers whose handwriting might excuse Federigo of Urbino for regretting the invention of print. There were mosaicists who despised painting as the perishable pride of a day. Woodcarvers like Baccio Daniolo, whose carved chairs, tables, chests, and beds were the glory of Florentine homes. And nameless other workers in the minor arts. Florence was so rich in art that she could bear the depredations of invaders, pontiffs, and millionaires from Charles the Eighth to our own times, and still retain so much of delicate workmanship that no man has ever compassed all the treasures deposited in that one city by the two centuries of the Renaissance. Or by one century. For just as the great age of Florence in art had begun with Cosimo's return from exile in 1434, so it ended with Andrea del Sarto's death in 1530. Civil strife, Savonarola's Puritan regime, siege and defeat and plague— had destroyed the joyful spirit of Lorenzo's day, had broken the frail lyre of art. But the great chords had been struck, and their music echoed throughout the peninsula. Others came to Florentine artists from other Italian cities, even from France, Spain, Hungary, Germany, and Turkey. To Florence flocked a thousand artists to learn her lore and form their styles, Piero della Francesca, Perugino, Raphael. From Florence, a hundred artists took the gospel of art to half a hundred Italian cities and to foreign lands. In those half hundred cities, the spirit and taste of the age, the generosity of wealth, the heritage of technique, worked together with the Florentine stimulus. Presently, all Italy, from the Alps to Calabria, was painting, carving, building, composing, singing, in a creative frenzy that seemed to know in the fever of its haste that soon the wealth would vanish in war and the pride of Italy would be humbled under an alien tyranny, and the prison doors of dogma would close again upon the marvelous, exuberant mind of Renaissance man.